Today on the Skiff Podcast, we're sharing the latest episode from our colleagues at the Airline Weekly Lounge that discusses Southwest's holiday collapse. Search for Airline Weekly Lounge wherever you get your podcast to hear more from the team. Enjoy the conversation. Happy New Year from the Airline Weekly Lounge. I'm your host, Edward Russell, and this week I'm joined by my colleague, Jay Shabat, to discuss Southwest's operational fiasco over the holidays and the status of the European recovery. We hope you enjoy. Hey, Jay, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too, Ned. Did you have a nice and relaxing break? I did have a good relaxing break, uh, in part because I did not uh, go anywhere near an airport or get on any plane. So I missed all of the uh, operational uh, uh, snafus that occurred over the holiday season. Same here, knock on wood. Yeah, I'm uh, (laughs) very happy about that. Uh, And speaking of those operational snafus, uh, Southwest had itself quite a miserable uh, holiday season. They absolutely did. And that's that's really the the headline coming into the new year in the U.S. Southwest, for those that uh, are not fully aware, uh, canceled roughly 15,000 plus flights from December 22nd to December 29th, uh, starting with a polar vortex storm that uh, you know, crossed the country and, and canceled flights at every airline. But then Southwest was unique and unable to restart their operations prompting what uh, was has received heavy media coverage, a, a meltdown of their operation, it didn't really reset until the new year. Right. And I should say our colleague, uh, Justin Dawes, did a, an excellent uh, analysis of some of the software issues and employee issues that uh, contributed to the, to the meltdown. And I recommend you check that out on the, uh, the Skift website. We'll, um, we'll include a link to yeah. that story in in the show notes for for listeners if you visit the airline if you visit airlineweekly.com. But, yeah, uh, and it, it is funny. I was I was looking at old uh, airline weekly articles on Southwest from years prior, and uh, it's it's this whole idea that Southwest is kind of a laggard on information technology is is nothing new. In fact, from 2017. We ran an article that listed some of Southwest, uh, some of the problems they were having, some of the challenges they were facing. And a direct quote from that article in 2017 was, uh, Southwest information technology was becoming woefully out of date. <laughs> so it's um, not something new. Now, we should be clear that they have an impeccable safety record. Nothing, um, you know, we don't want to accuse any airlines here of uh, n- neglecting uh, safety-related IT, um, but it is true that they were, you know, rather late in adopting. I remember back when they were, uh, you know, managing their network, optimizing their network with uh, something called a garage o meister or something like that. You know, something oh, they just they just they just built in house. Um, you know, very rudimentary kind of stuff. Uh, they were, I think, it wasn't until twenty. What did we say? We were talking about this earlier in 2017, 2018, when they adopted the. Uh, Amadeus reservation system internally, um, which is, you know, kind of their first modern system that they've had. And it was necessary uh, so for them yeah. to to begin international flights. Like they they simply could not sell international flights without adopting a new reservation system. Um, you know, that was a key key part of that. Right. And, and they couldn't even do before that system, they couldn't even do things like fly red eyes or coach here with other airlines. And now they can, and they're still not for commercial reasons. But this was an airline that, uh, yeah, it was it was rather um, technologically unsophisticated. Uh, so that's gotten better on the commercial side with the, with the Amadeus update. Um, and as we kind of learned, they still <laughs> they still had a lot to do on the operations side, and uh, we'll see if they address that going forward. Absolutely. And and management had said that they had planned to make uh, continue to make investments in their technology prior to the meltdown, though, 
we widely expect those uh, investments are going to take a step up a, a few levels probably now that this situation has has happened um but you know the costs are going to be to southwest are going to be more than just it, it investments now you know uh we don't have a number from southwest they have not provided any guidance yet on the cost of the situation and they they may before they're they're reporting their earnings on January 26 they may offer some guidance before that. We may not know anything until the report on January 26. But Wall Street analysts have given us some ideas around what the cost could be. And the numbers I, I'm seeing in several places is about a 500 to $600 million hit to the fourth quarter alone. Now, I want to emphasize that is there's going to be a lot of costs that are going to continue into the first quarter and maybe the second quarter. For example, they're offering people uh, rapid rewards points and um, vouchers were were disrupted and those costs are not going to be logged until people actually redeem those. So so there's going to be some lagging costs that are going to come out later. But uh, the fourth quarter hit is estimated uh, in in the half a billion dollar range. Yeah, that that fourth quarter earnings call that's coming up, uh, that's that's going to be quite an event. I've got my popcorn ready. Same here. Everyone <laughs> break out the popcorn. Yeah, sit back and, and we'll all enjoy. But it, it's going to be interesting to see what they have to say. I think that will probably be the first opportunity where Southwest management is going to sit down and speak in depth about the situation and what they're doing. Of course, they've done some media, but I think that's going to be the first in-depth t- talk uh, about the situation and what's going to happen come as, as the airline comes out of it. Yeah, and if these numbers that people are throwing about are, you know, anywhere close to correct, it sounds to me like this might be the most expensive operational meltdown in airline industry history. I, I don't know that to be the case, but that's my hunch anyway. Just to give a uh yeah, just just for context, um, you know, we mentioned could could run up into the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um in 2018, Southwest had an operating profit of 3.2 billion. Um, 2019, which in 2019, they had a, was a little bit of a challenging year for them because they had, uh, 737 max issues and whatnot, but, um, also $3 billion in operating profit. Uh, so that's, you know, when you're talking about a couple hundred million dollars, that's, it's, it's a lot of, that's, that's a big chunk of annual profits right there. Absolutely. Real money. No, it's it's definitely going to be real money. You know, I one thing I'll be watching is to see whether Southwest sus- suspends the dividend that they announced in December, uh, uh, just two weeks prior to the meltdown. Yeah, that's going to be something to watch. But uh, you know that what they do for investors and and what they do for customers, of course, different things. But it's yeah. it's going to be real money, and it's going to be a hit to Southwest balance sheet for a quarter or two. You know, that said, I, I know well, and most people in the airline industry do too, is consumers have short memories. And it's probably, you know, as as long as Southwest steps up and, and makes the investment and says the right things, you know, probably won't, uh, the, the impact from the meltdown probably won't last beyond a couple quarters. Yeah, short memories. And also in a, in a lot of cases, air transport is almost like, it's almost like public transportation in the sense that, you know, a lot of people, if you, if you live in St. Louis and you need to get to, uh, you know, your name is the Phoenix and uh, you need to get there at a certain time, chances are it's Southwest is going to be the, you know, the, the, the airline that's going to get you there when you want to get there and people are going to fly. So it's, I don't think, you know, this is not going to, result in a mass exodus of uh, or mass loss of market share by any means. I mean, the airline, maybe if the, if the industry was more fragmented, but it's things have gotten so consolidated that I don't think that's a long term term issue for Southwest. Um, Not at all. And you bring up a good point, yeah. Jay, is, you know, in, in many markets in the U.S., especially in the South and the West, um, no pun intended, Southwest is mm-hmm. essentially, you know, the is essentially public transportation. Uh, look at California. Southwest operates by far the most interstate routes. Uh, legislators in Sacramento, if they are coming from anywhere other than basically LAX, Southwest is their only option. You know, there's... It, People are still going to be flying them and because they just there's yeah, there's really no other option to get many places unless you want to take a long circuitous route. I remember when there were plans to build a high speed rail line in Texas and, you know, these things cost billions of dollars. And uh, Herb Kelleher at the time, the founder of Southwest, he said, yeah, just give me the billions of dollars and I'll fly everyone 
for free around Texas. <laughs> and that'll be that'll be the public transportation network for, for Texas. So yeah, it's I, I don't think that will be an issue. Um the balance sheet wise, you know, someone asked me, a friend of mine, you know, <laughs> who flies Southwest a lot, asked me, like, oh, I've got all these uh you know, miles with Southwest, I have their credit card. Are they going to go out of business? <laughs> and I said, no, 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 no. Don't, don't worry about that. That's the last thing you have to worry about. Um, they do have, you know, this couldn't have happened to an airline with a stronger balance sheet. Uh, this is an airline with, you know, tremendous set of assets and great, you know, a lot of cash. And so, so no, you know, no long-term financial damage here. It's, it's, it's more a question of, yeah, shareholders are going to be hit in, in the, in the short run. Uh, they're still going to make money next year, assuming you know no other crazy things happen with the economy or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's it's going to be their margins are going to be meaningfully impacted for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, changing, uh, we're going to take a quick break and come back and talk a little bit about Europe. And we're back. So, Jay, Eurocontrol put out an interesting report giving their sort of uh, 2022 recap and an outlook for 2023. Uh, what were some of the highlights uh, in that? Yeah, so Eurocontrol is responsible for um, air navigation. They kind of manage the air traffic control for uh, not just Europe itself, but even some countries surrounding Europe. I think parts of the airspace of Morocco and even into you know the former Soviet Union area and things up. Uh, so they um, put out a really, really interesting report. It's a 31 page report uh, summarizing the uh, basically the, what you know things that happened in the year 2021 gave a lot of statistics. And they so some of the headline takeaways, you know, so they said in 2022, uh, there were 9.3 million flights that they managed over Europe's airspace. And that was about 83 percent of 2019 levels. So getting getting close. Um, they said next year, this is just a forecast, they expect it to get back to about 92%. And they don't expect it to get back completely until 2025 or 2026. Now, there are a lot of variation within those numbers. So there are some airlines that are you know busier now than they were in 2019. Ryanair, for example, has 9% more flights. Uh, Wizz Air has 14% more flights. But most airlines um, and airports are are less busy. Uh, you know, EasyJet stands out. There are twenty percent, you know, less fewer flights um, in twenty twenty two than they did in twenty nineteen. Uh, you can go down the list. Uh, you know, Air France down twenty percent, KLM down eighteen percent, et cetera. British Airways down twenty nine percent. Right. Uh, I want to call out Germany in particular is having a very very difficult time with. Their recovery. That's um, interesting because kind of yeah. I think of Germans, you know, flooding to Mediterranean beaches and everything during the summer. But but what you know, what's you know, tell us more. What what's going on in Germany? Right. So so the outbound tourism, as you mentioned, is relatively healthy. It's it's the fact that Germany doesn't have a rather you know it doesn't have a large, relatively speaking, uh, domestic tourism industry. Uh, I shouldn't say domestic, but Germany itself is not a large inbound tourist market. Is what I'm trying to say. And then on top of that, you have some issues like exposure to Russia and Ukraine. You have a lot of exposure to some of these East Asian markets that are still, you know, still slow to recover. Uh, it, it is interesting. You know, we think of the East Asian markets as kind of the last frontier in the recovery, which is generally true. I mean, if you compare flight activity now versus 2019, it's these Asian markets like Hong Kong and Tokyo and Singapore, which are still you know, way down versus four years ago. But if you put East Asia aside, the one the, the country that stands out as being very, very slow to recover is Germany. And it's for some of those reasons we already talked about, the relatively low leisure exposure, exposure to Russia, East Asia, Ukraine. Um, and then you also have some economic issues. I mean, Germany is a very, you know, corporate heavy market. Uh, and we know corporate travel is not, you know, it's been slow to recover. Uh, Germany's, you know, some of Germany company, German companies are very heavily exposed to, or they're facing higher energy costs now. They're, um, a lot of German companies uh, are prolific sellers to Chinese buyers and that market's kind of, you know, has been weakening. So there are a lot of reasons why, uh, you know, German 
corporate uh, travelers, their budgets are kind of pinched right now. So those are just some of the reasons. A lot of low-cost carriers, and I think you've written about this before, Ned, that uh, EasyJet right. has pulled a lot of their flights from Germany. Same with Ryanair and Wizz Air. There yeah, we, some... I wrote about uh, Berlin uh, just uh, in December about how you know, it's uh, Eurowings is is growing there this coming spring uh, just as we've seen Ryanair and EasyJet pull back some. So there's definitely been and you know, EasyJet has spoken publicly about you know weak uh, weak bookings resulting in them shifting capacity to other markets like Portugal for one. Yeah, yeah, and and what's interesting is that uh, despite all of this, uh, Lufthansa, the Germany's biggest airline they left tons of group it, they're doing they're doing okay they're like financially they're doing fine they had a good you know a good end of 2022 uh third quarter anyway uh and they you know what they say is uh they're just not that exposed to the german market um as, not as much as you might think a lot of their um they said the number in their last earnings call i don't remember it off the top of my head but uh a lot of their traffic now comes from markets or originates in mark originates in markets outside of Germany, uh, including even the United States, which is you know relatively healthy market. So the you know the one doesn't translate to the other just because Germany is having a hard time with traffic recovery doesn't mean that Lufthansa is doing bad. They're actually doing you know pretty right. well. Right. I mean Lufthansa um, so kinda... to, 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 you know carries so much uh, you know uh, transit traffic that it's <laughs> you can hardly talk specifically of the German market, whereas uh, you know <laughs> Lufthansa flies so many people. I mean, my own experience with Lufthansa this summer, it's it's you know Frankfurt remains quite the bustling hub with many people coming through, even on less capacity. Yeah, no, excellent point that there's a lot of Lufthansa's traffic is just passing through Germany. It's not uh, actually uh, arriving or departing from Germany. I'll give you just a few statistics on, on individual airports. Um, I was looking uh, just before this call at uh, the German Airport Association publishes numbers for uh, traffic numbers for the airports in the country. And for the month of November, so November 2021 versus November 2019, uh, Frankfurt Airport's traffic is down 19%, which sounds bad. Until you get to Munich, which is down 25%, Ooh. Hamburg down 33%, and Dusseldorf down 37%, and Berlin, this is all the airports combined, um, then and now, down 39%. <laughs> so, wow. I mean, this is, yeah, this this is a very, very, very serious decline here. Um, and I wonder, you know, you have to wonder whether some of that's going to, or how long it's going to take to come back, if ever. Yeah. Um, well, domestic I mean, markets it... in particular, and I was going to just say domestic markets in particular are very, very depressed. And part of that is, you know, just less company traffic, fewer LCCs. And I'd like to, I mean, the asterisk I'd like to for domestic German travel, remember, there's been a push to get more people to take trains in Germany. They yes. had their, their famed nine euro ticket last summer that proved very popular. Admittedly, it wasn't for intercity trains is only for regional and local. But I, I read in a lot of places that there were more people taking intercity trains and then using the nine euro ticket locally than in years past. So, you know, that has to play a role as well. We don't know how much of a role it's probably sm it's <laughs> definitely not 30 some odd percent of people are have shifted to trains, but uh, I'd say a point or two for sure. It's yeah, I'm sure that's, yeah. that's a factor. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's going to yeah, be interesting to watch. And I know as we go into tw this year, 2023, that there's, you know, airlines are planning more flights to Germany. United promises to launch Washington Berlin this summer like they did last summer. We'll see if it happens. But, you know, there's there is some capacity coming back, but it's it's going to be interesting to watch Germany now. Yeah, and so not and so I was just going to so not to end on a gloomy note here. I'll give you Euro controls kind of all star European market. There's one market in particular among major uh, you know, large, large airline markets here. Uh, one that was actually busier in 2022 versus 2019, that was Greece. Oh, I was going to say, and, let me guess. Let me guess. Oh, I was going to say Greece. You, I gave you the quiz. <laughs> yeah, we, should, we should let our listeners guess too. We should have a listener quiz. But yeah, the answer is Greece. Portugal is only down 3%. So that was another kind of, you know, relatively good performer. No, yeah, no, Greece. I mean, considering, look at how strong Asian Airlines was, I, I, my, Top guest before I read your story on this is uh, Jay 
was going to be Greece really led the way. So, you know, and I, I expect we're going to see more of that considering all the new routes I'm already you know, reporting on going into Greece for this summer. So I expect we're going to see more of that. Yeah. But, and remember yeah. this this time 10 years ago, Greece was in the middle of this big sovereign debt crisis. People were wondering whether they even, you know, be able to stay in the eurozone. Whether, whether the euro they, would would uh, survive. That's or whether the euro would survive at all, right? And Greece was kind of at the center of that. And there was, you know, the I mean, you talk about people people mention, you know, Greece had a recession. Now they had a great depression. <laughs> I mean, it was the economy there contracted by I think more than 20%. Um, and it's interesting to see that now, uh, remember tourism is a very huge part of the Greek economy. So with that doing so well. Um, it's nice to see kind of Greece uh, sort of, a, you know, on the on the upswing. For sure. For sure. Well, on that note, we will leave it there. Jay, it's always a pleasure to, to chat with you. Listeners, you can reach myself, Edward, at er at skiff.com. You can reach Jay at js at skiff.com. Jay, again, a pleasure. And here's to a, a great 2023 ahead. Yes, indeed. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Airline Weekly Lounge podcast. Check out airlineweekly.com for a new issue every Monday and updates on the latest airline news throughout the week.